with goods, have need of nothing, knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable. Keep your finger right there. Knowest not thou art wretched and miserable. Judges 16. Verse 20. She said, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. He awoke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. And he wist not that the Lord had spewed him out of his mouth. He didn't even know he'd made God sick. You know why we've got to have a big celebrity and a big band and a big hoopla and a big promotion? Because God's not in it. God's not in it. You know why we've got to sell tickets? Because nobody would come. We didn't make them think it was a production. You know what's sad? American, and I'm speaking as a whole, I'm speaking in general. I know God's got a remnant in this country, but you know what's sad? These mainline denominations, they don't even know God's moved out. They don't even know it. They just think you guys are, are some sort of weird fanatics. They don't even know we're carnal. We're not coming anywhere close to the mark. They, they think we're so far out there and so wacko when the Spirit of God moves upon us at times, they think we're on some kind of radical fringe. And if Paul the Apostle came to visit us one Thursday night, he'd chew us out. He would. We don't even know how wretched we are. There are people go home and they turn on that channel 55 and they watch that and they actually think they're looking at Christianity. They, they don't even know that's a miserable attempt at Hollywood. They don't even know it. They don't even know we've got to have a great big amplifier because we can't sing with the power of God on our lives. They don't even know we need big spotlights and stage lights because the light of the gospel isn't shining. I mean, they don't, they don't even know. I'm not saying that critically. I'm saying that having read volumes after volume after volume of church history and realizing that there isn't much biblical Christianity left out there. And the worst of it is are the poor hypocrites who think they are biblical Christianity. If you think I'm talking about everybody else and not you, you're the problem. Because that self-righteousness and that hypocrisy and that, and that pride is, is the root sin goes all the way back to Genesis 3. That's where we are. Sad day. Look what the Lord says here. Thou sayest, I am rich, increased with goods, have need of nothing. Knowest not thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and, and what? And blind. Keep your finger right there. Come to Judges chapter 16. Old Samson, he just kept getting closer and closer and closer to the world. Not only did the Lord depart from him, verse 20, verse 21 says, But the Philistines took him. Put out his eyes, brought him down to Gaza. Brought him down to Gaza. Isn't that the same place he got out of? With the door, with the gate, with the bars? Isn't that sad? After all this light and truth that God gave us in the Philadelphia church period, then we've gone right back into bondage to false religion paganism in God's name after all that light you know with everything God showed this world from from 1600 to 1850 you wouldn't think there'd be a cannibal cookie eaten papist left on the face of the earth well how come there's millions of them just something about Gaza that's appealing 
Samson got his eyes put out. Now, I want to show you something. Come back to Revelation 3. <coughs> Revelation 3. Look at verse 18. I counsel thee. Here's my advice, Samson. Here's my advice, church. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich. You know what the Lord said in verse 18? You can still have something of God in these terrible times, but it's going to cost you something. You're going to have to buy it. Are you willing to pay the price of obedience to the Word of God? You can have God's blessing even in these times of declension and apostasy, but you're going to have to pay the price. That's God's counsel to the church at Laodicea. Thou mayest be rich. White raiment, that thou mayest be clothed. That the shame, look at that, the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Hold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him. I will sup with him and he with me. Come into who? Sup with who? Somebody that's been lukewarm, poor, blind, wretched, naked, miserable, spewing out of his mouth. The Lord said, if, you, if you'll turn that thing around, I'll, I'll come to sup with you. Come to Judges chapter 16. The shame of thy nakedness. Bible says in verse 23, Lords of the Philistines gather themselves together, offer a great sacrifice unto Dagon their God, and rejoice. They said, Our God has delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hands. When the people saw him, they praised their God. They said, Our God hath delivered him, uh, delivered into our hands our enemy, and the destroyer of our country, which slew many of us. Came to pass when their hearts were merry, they said, Call for Samson, he may make a sport. The Bible said in Revelation 3, The shame of thy nakedness do appear. You run that word sport through the Bible. This is a horrible situation here. Horrible situation. Called for Samson out of the prison house, and he made them sport. They set him between the pillars. Samson said to the lad that held him by the hand, Young fellow, I need some eye salve. Would you help me see my way? It's going to cost me something, but I'm going to ask God to come have supper with me one last time. Every time I've ever gotten near these Philistines, they've messed my life up. I'm going to separate myself from them forever, and it's going to cost me. Boy, would you help me? Need some eye salve. Would you help me find those pillars? He went and found those pillars. He said in verse 28, Samson called unto the Lord and said, O Lord God! Remember when we used to have supper together. Strengthen me, I pray thee, only this once. God, would you come in and sup with me? I may be at once avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars upon which the house stood, and on which it was borne up, the one with his right hand, the other with his left. And Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. Now look at this. And he bowed himself. This is the first time you ever read this about Samson. With all his might. He's not lukewarm anymore. He's not half-hearted anymore. He's not double-minded anymore. He's giving God 
everything he's got. And the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people that were therein. So the dead which he slew at his death were more than they which he slew in his life. Wouldn't it be something if the church the world over said we don't have much left? God, just give us enough sight. Just one last time stand against the Philistines. And give you everything we got. And let the church on earth with its last gasp before you come for it. Take out more than she's taken out in all the days of its history. Look, folks, we've got radio now. We've got TV now. We've got computers now. We've got billions of dollars now. We've got airplanes. We've got boats. We've got printing presses. If the church of the living God would just sell out to Him just for a few short years before He came back, we could win more people to Jesus than have ever been won in the whole history of the world. Everything else about Samson matched up. I wonder if it just might happen. I wonder if God might just start something. People just say, you know, it's going to cost me something. I'm going to buy a little power of God. I'm going to go out fighting for the Lord. Wouldn't it be incredible? Judges 16... Verse 31, Then his brethren, and all the house of his father came down and took him and brought him up. <laughs> you know, as soon as that Laodicean thing is over, we're going to be reunited with all the brethren and everybody living in the father's house is going to come with him. And we're just going to be taken up. We'll all be together. How about that? We took him and brought him up. Amen. I don't know how far we are in this Laodicean time period here, but what I see out there is pretty wretched. Talk to Brother Mike, ask him some of the stuff that comes through in the bookstores. Talk to, don't just ask me, talk to preachers that travel this country. Ask them what they have to deal with. Folks, we are sitting in living rooms dealing with Christians who are doing things that lost people would have been ashamed to do in your granddaddy's day. It's wretched. Miserable out there. You stand up for Jesus on a street corner in a marketplace on your job, you get as much grief from people who say they're Christians as you will from the world or more. It's a tough day. Blind. Well, you know, the virgin births out of your Bible. I don't see where that's a problem. You're blind. You know, the Trinity's not in your Bible. Well, I don't see where that's all such a big deal. You're blind. I didn't say you weren't saved, but you're blind. That's the day in which we live. But God said to that church at Laodicea, If you want to, I will still come in and fellowship with you. But you've got to repent. I'm not fellowshipping with that. But if you'll repent, I'll come in. And I'll sup with you. Could happen. Could happen. So you know Samson died in that last stand against the Philistines. Better than grind, died grinding at the mill. He was going to die blind. He was going to die naked. He was going to die a slave. Instead he chose to die a servant of God.
I don't, God helping me, I don't want to settle into socially acceptable American Christianity. God helping me, I want to keep repenting. And buying enough ice salve to help me see my real condition. Maybe, maybe, just maybe, before God raptures His church, He'll come in here and have supper with us one night. Just bring a revival and sweep this community. Still do it. Folks, we got more translations, more books on how to live for the Lord, more pamphlets on how to pray, more revivals, more seminars we've ever had in the history of the world, and there's not revival taking place anywhere in this country. It only comes through repentance. Buy that I salve. But if that story of Samson matches up like I think it does, there's still a chance to do something for God. There's still a chance to see God move. Wouldn't you like to be part of that? Get up there to heaven, the Lord said, Here's one that started in Wales. And here's the one that started in South Africa. And here's the one that started in New England. And here's the one just before the rapture started down there in Deland, Florida. Be something, be part of the last revival in church history before the whole building came tumbling down. Could happen. See, you really believe that? Every other day. And every other day I believe there ain't a chance in the world anything's going to happen. God could do something. God's not bound. God's not limited. He's able. He's able. Let's pray. Father, I'll be uh, next Sunday and so plan on staying and helping with that if you can. Then here's a, here's a good letter. Just opened this up this morning. comes from uh, Kentucky. It says, uh, Dear Pastor, I'm writing for two reasons. First, I want to thank you for writing such a powerful booklet on being in debt. I am a professional debt collector. Everything you say regarding debt and debtors is 100% accurate. I see the horrible consequences of personal indebtedness every day of the week. Please continue doing what you are doing and saying what you are saying so that eventually I will no longer have a profession as a debt collector. I do not know if you agree or not, but... I worked two years as a third-party collector on charged-off credit cards. It's amazing what people pay in finance charges, interest, late payment, over-the-limit payment charges. I would say that many Christians pay more in interest and finance charges over a 12-month period than they give to their church. Amen. That's interesting, isn't it? And then he says, uh, writes and asks for some Bibles to send to, uh, to the Philippines. And we'll be glad to help him with that as well. So, uh, praise the Lord. If you've not gotten that book yet, um, we'll sell you one cheap. If you don't have the money, we'll give you good terms on that. <laughs> All right, Judges chapter 17. Judges chapter 17. If you're visiting with us this morning, we pick a book of the Bible and try our best to preach and teach right through it from one end to the other. We have come to the 17th chapter of Judges, and I hate to say this, ladies and gentlemen, but it, it hardly seems possible after Judges 1 through 16, but from here on it gets worse. In fact, Judges 17 through 21 is so so awful that I have really prayed about just sitting in the office and, and putting it on tape and not even taking you through it, but God put it in the Bible, so it must be that He wants us to read it, it must be that He wants us to consider it, it must be that He wants us to know about it. When we get to Judges 17, what we have in the, in the remainder of this book is the Lord giving us insight into the lives of the people that the judges had to rescue. It's not chronological. 
Judges 1 through 16, we have the men that God raised up to deliver the Israelites who were in bondage to the heathen and in bondage to their enemies because of their sin. And, and the chapters 1 through 16 focused on those judges, those deliverers, those saviors of the people. We really didn't have much detail on the people themselves other than they sold themselves to do evil and God sold them into bondage. But in Judges 17 to 21, we, we don't look at the preachers who are preaching in America and trying to get the people to do right. In Judges 17 to 21, we get a look at the America they're preaching to. And it's not pretty. It's not pretty. Judges 17 verse 1 says, And there was a man, Mount Ephraim, whose name was Micah. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, please help us this morning, Lord, to see the terrible condition into which men and women and families in a society can fall without a real God, a true God, without a holy Bible, without a final authority in their lives. God, help us to be warned. Help us to beware. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The only tough part about Judges 17 and 18 is deciding which of the bad guys is the worst. Verse number 2 says this, And he, this is Micah, said unto his mother, The eleven hundred shekels of silver that were taken from thee, about which thou cursedst, and spakest of also in mine ears, behold, the silver is with me, I took it. And his mother said, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my son. (laughs) Is that a mess or what? We got a boy stealing from his mother. We've got a mother cursing in the presence of her son and then praising the Lord when she gets her stolen money back. James chapter 3 and verse number 10 says, Out of the same mouth comes blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Here's a woman that can cuss one minute and sing praise the Lord the next. Here's a man that can swear one minute and offer prayer the next. Here's a church member that can gossip about you and then say glad to see you in the, in the, same, in the same week. Here's somebody that, that is, is so controlled by the flesh and yet so aware that when something good happens, it was the great big man up in the sky, that you just can't hardly tell what you're dealing with from one minute to the next. That sounds pretty typical of our day. Why you blankety blank, blank, blank? Oh, I didn't take it. It's right here. Oh, praise the Lord. Doesn't that seem a little odd? Doesn't that seem a little bizarre? Doesn't it seem strange that the same people that work for 20, 30, 40 years to get God and the Bible and prayer and Jesus Christ out of our country wanted you to pray when the airplanes flew into the Twin Towers? Pray to who? Pray about what? Isn't an amazing thing how the people that, don't, that, that, that go out of their way to blaspheme the Lord with every newscast remind you to, to remember so-and-so in your prayers when some tragedy or some disaster happens. That's our world. That's our society. That's Micah and his mother. Well, she's cussing one minute, she's praising God the next. Well, you can understand her being a little uptight. You've got a son who's a thief, steal from his own mother. But it's, it's going to get stickier as we go. Verse 3, when he had restored the 1,100 shekels of silver to his mother, his mother said, I had wholly dedicated the silver unto the Lord from my hand for my son to make a graven image and a molten image. Now, that's pretty weird. I have dedicated my money 
to the Lord and in the Lord's name with my money I'm going to violate the second commandment. The Lord said, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Yeah, but you know, that's that old Ten Commandments stuff. You know, that's, I mean, we, we don't have to go by that, that, that anymore. And that, I mean, who, who really believes that's exactly what God said anyway? I mean, that was so long ago. And, and after all these years of enlightenment and all these years of, of religious instruction, surely, surely we're not going to hold to that narrow code of, of Hebrew ethics. And I mean, how do we know God even said that anyway? I mean, was anybody up there with Moses? I love the Lord just as much as you do. I believe in God just as much as you do. And who are you to say that my way of worshiping God isn't as valid as your way of worshiping God? I'm going to dedicate this money to the Lord. And with this money, I'm going to make a graven image for the Lord. So what Bible do you use down there at that church? Oh, any Bible. I mean, it doesn't matter. Well, who told you it didn't matter? Well, you know, we're having a wonderful church service this week. We're ordaining uh, uh, Sister So-and-so to be one of our deaconesses. And, you know, it's just wonderful. It's the first lesbian deacon we've ever had in our church. And, well, well that's wrong. Oh, now, you're not one of those narrow-minded, intolerant, religious fundamentalists, are you? We're doing it for the Lord. Hey, every wicked and ungodly thing that's condemned in this Bible is being done today in the name of the Lord by people who claim to love the Lord. It's, it's nothing new. She said, I've dedicated... Oh, good, son, I'm so glad you gave me back the money you stole from me. Because that money was dedicated to the Lord so I could make a graven image unto the Lord. Pretty bizarre, isn't it? But pretty typical. Now, therefore, I will restore it unto thee. So she gives the money right back to the boy. Verse 4 says, Yet he restored the money unto his mother. No, Mom, you take it, really. I want you to have it. <laughs> now, now, look at this. Look at verse 4. And his mother took 200 shekels of silver and gave them to the founder. Now, here's, an, here's another striking parallel to our day. Look at verse number 3. His mother said, I had wholly dedicated the silver unto the Lord. How much did she dedicate to the Lord? Every bit of it. I wholly dedicated the silver unto the Lord. How much silver was there? Verse 3. 1,100 shekels. What did she give to the founder to make the image in verse number 4? 200 shekels. Now, I don't know who she had for a math teacher. But 1,100 is not 200, and 200 is not 1,100. And the last time I read about somebody walking in and saying, Bless God, we gave the whole thing to the Lord, hallelujah, God dropped the man and his wife both dead in the middle of the auditorium. That's <laughs> Ananias and Sapphira. Now, the Bible says in Romans 12 and verse number 2, or verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto the Lord. And, and, and our churches today are full of people singing songs and giving testimony and, and puffing themselves up and, and in some way or another proclaiming that they're wholly dedicated to the Lord. When the truth of the matter is they're given about 200 shekels out of 1,100. You know what wholly dedicated meant to that woman? It didn't mean anything. You know what I've given it all meant to that woman? It meant I've given as much as I want to give. Now, listen, you don't have to give God a dime. You don't have to give Him ten minutes of your time. You don't have to give God any of your talent. But if you're not serving God, say so. If you're serving God ten percent of the time, say so. 
if you're serving the Lord with part of your life and serving yourself with part of your life, that's okay. Just be honest about it. Just don't try and pretend like Americans do that we're devoted, wholehearted servants of the Lord Jesus Christ when God looks in the ledger book and sees you're only giving me two out of eleven. So what's going on? Nothing new. We were down there, boy. I made my bi-annual visit to the Christian school in the county. It takes about two years to get over my, uh, my visits, and then I get asked back. And, I, you know, I'd, I'd tell them the same thing I say here, but they stand up and they say the pledge. You know, I pledge allegiance to the flag. And one good thing, the principals taught them all to... to emphasize two words and all the kids going to the republic for which it stands one nation under God and so he's they got that and then they turn and they pledge to the flag and then they then one of them holds the Bible and if you've been through Christian school they I pledge allegiance to the Bible God's holy word I will make it a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path and they said that pledge and so the principal introduced me I got up and I said uh, most of y'all need to come right now and repent of lying Because your allegiance is not to the Bible. And you have not made it a lamp under your feet. And you have not made it a light under your path. Because there's nothing in that Bible told you you could watch MTV, but you're watching it. And there's nothing, and I just went down the list, and it was only about five minutes into the, into the visit until all the younger kids who hadn't met me knew what the older kids meant. <laughs> when they told them what chapel was going to be like that day. Listen, we live in a day and age when we determine what holy, devoted to the Lord is. We don't let God determine it. We determine it. And then we go about in our self-righteousness uh, imagining that everybody's going to be impressed by what great Christians we are when the only reason we think we're great Christians is because we've met the mark we set for ourselves. I try to read this mark. And you know, every time I go to this Bible, I've just got to back up and say, uh, hang on a minute. <laughs> better, better twist the valve and let some of the air out of the head. Because there's no reason for that thing to be getting puffed up when you've only given 200 shekels of silver and you've still got 900 left in your pocket. I've wholly dedicated to the Lord. All right, verse 4. And uh, he made thereof, oh boy, he got a two-for-one deal. They were having a special down at the Godmaker's shop. He got a graven image and a molten image. Whoo, what a deal. Boy, she'd been saving up, you know, to get that graven image. And she got down there, and this week, special. You can have a dolly for 200 shekels, and we'll throw in a, a little man-god statue for no extra charge. Whew. Man, isn't that great? One for the one for the dashboard of the car and the truck for one low price. I was witnessing to uh, somebody Friday and we got talking about culture and society and how how things have gone downhill and and uh, I said, you know what's, what's sad is we live in a day when the things that people ought to take serious, they don't. And the things that people should just kind of let them go, they take serious. And we got talking about the, about the music thing, and you've got to admit, uh, it's been a long time since you heard anything like, I don't care if it snows or freezes as long as i got my plastic Jesus. You, they, they don't make songs like that anymore. And, 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 and isn't it amazing that, that Americans, Americans, walk into a bar, get half drunk, flirt with another man's wife, and get in the car and drive home and think they're going to be safe because they got an open New Testament laying on their dashboard. Got the, got the Bible on the dash, warding off the boogeyman. 
You know, I, 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 could, I could really upset you this morning just stand up here and talk about all these idols and all these dollies and all these images. Hey, if somebody had to make it with their hands, it's not a God. If it came out of a fire or a plastic mold or, or you baked it in an oven or you carved it with a knife, it's nothing but a piece of junk. Micah's got his graven image, man. Verse 5, the man Micah had a house of gods. Whoo, he's real religious. Made an ephod and a teraphim. Consecrated one of his sons who became his priest. That happens a lot of people won't go to church. Just end up kind of creating this little, this little non-biblical, unscriptural kind of family religion type deal. You don't want me to go there either, do you? Verse 6, In those days, there was no king in Israel. Now watch. But every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Well, what does God say about it? Well, the way I look at it, well, yeah, but what does the Bible say? Well, you know the way I see it. What does the Bible say? Well, you know, your view and my view. Yeah, but what does the Bible say? Without the Bible, it's every man for himself. It's a, a free-for-all. Verse number 7. There was a young man out of Bethlehem, Judah, of the family of Judah. who was a Levite. He sojourned there. And the man departed out of the city from Bethlehem, Judah, to sojourn where he could find a place. And he came to Mount Ephraim, to the house of Micah, as he journeyed. And Micah said unto him, Whence comest thou? And he said unto him, I am a Levite of Bethlehem, Judah, and I go to sojourn where I might find a place. And... Micah said unto him, Dwell with me, and be to me a father and a priest. Hmm, there's a novel idea. Here's a man that's not your father, but you're going to call him father. And here's a man that's not a priest ordained by God, but you're going to make him your priest can't think of any parallel, so let's move on. <laughs> Micah said unto him, Dwell with me, and what, do you all know something I don't know? <laughs> Micah said unto him, Dwell with me, and be unto me a father and a priest, and I will give thee ten shekels of silver by the year. Now think about that. Let's suppose, Daniel, there's a couple of fellows just came in if you want to help them find a seat. Let's suppose this guy really won a priest of the Lord sent to help this man. Okay? I mean, let's just suppose this, this guy is going to minister to Micah and his family. Okay? Let's suppose he is going to be a, a father to them, a spiritual guide and a spiritual leader and watch over them and protect them. Let's suppose just for a minute this is a valid situation and God has sent this man to minister to these people. Micah considered that man's worth to be one-twentieth the value of a statue made by the founder that he set on the mantelpiece in his house of gods. That's pretty low estimation, isn't it? Pretty low estimation. It, I, listen, it, it, it costs money. It costs money to have a place for God's people to meet. It costs money to have a place to train young people, fellowship together. I understand that. But I'll tell you right now, this business of putting millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars into carpets and windows and chandeliers and, and, and monuments to sit and have church in and throwing five dollars toward, toward foreign missions... That's a, that's a bad situation, man. That's a bad heart condition. $200 for a graven image and $10 a year for the man that's going to be your preacher and your spiritual guide. Something, Something's really out of kilter there somewhere. Heart problem. So the Bible says, uh, I don't know, this priest wasn't making too much before that because he took, a, took the offer. <laughs> oh, well, take it back. He threw in... And a suit of apparel. 
I'll buy you a set of clothes every January. <laughs> How's that? Threw in a suit of apparel and, uh, and my victual. So he's got, he's got a, a place to live, food to eat, a set of clothes, and uh, $10, $10 a year. So the Levite went in. And the Levite was content to dwell with a man. And the young man was unto him as one of his sons. Now I'll tell you who's really unhappy about the whole deal. Verse 12 Micah consecrated the Levite, and the young man became his priest and was in the house of Micah. Look at verse 5. Look at the verse. Consecrated one of his sons who became his priest. Dad, what about me? Now you're not the priest anymore. But Dad, I want to be the priest. I like being the priest. I, I mean, it's fun being the priest. No, you're not the priest anymore. I got this. I got this guy here. I mean, he he's a Levite. He's better qualified than you. And so you just go go dust the idols, son. <laughs> oh, what a mess! Verse thirteen. Then said Micah. Now, now look at this. Then said Micah. Now I know that the Lord will do me good, seeing I have a Levite to my priest. The sad part is not that he hoped God would do him good or, or that he was wishing God would do him good or that he's rolling the dice and thinking God might do him good. The sad part is he said, Now I know, I know God is going to do me good because I just invented my own religion and violated everything written in Scripture. I've, I've gone contrary to the Levitical order. I've gone contrary to the order of worship. I've gone contrary to the Ten Commandments of God. And now I know God's going to bless me because I feel so good about my new religion. Man, that's where we're living. That's America today. Turn on that religious radio and a guy will get on there and for 30 minutes he'll lie and he'll pervert the scriptures and he'll twist and, 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 and blaspheme the Word of God. And then people have spent $25 on a book the guy wrote because they know God's going to bless them if they read that guy's book. Yeah. Oh, I just know it. I just know it. <laughs> Well, you just know it based on what? I mean, where, where, is the, where is the source of this knowledge? Where is the basis of this, I know God's going to bless me? Is it something God said in His Word? Is it something God has done throughout history, the history of the church? Is it something that, that you have seen the Lord establish in, in the New Testament Scriptures? I mean, where do you get this, not, I know God's going to bless me? We're living in tough times, folks. We're living in tough times. We live in a generation like the people in the days of the judges when people do what they want to do the way they want to do it with no regard for what God said in the Bible. And the worst part of it is when they've done so, they are still firmly and fully convinced that God's pleased with it and He's going to bless them. Isn't it weird? It's weird. It's weird. Some of y'all haven't been able to sleep for a week and a half, so let me just let me just help you out. Yeah, the Bible says it's a shame for a man to have long hair. Okay? That's what it says. It's a shame for a man to have long hair. So if a man should walk into our assembly who has long hair, there's no doubt about it. The fact that he tells everybody that God told him to do it doesn't make one bit of difference. God's not in it, even though the man thinks he is in God's will and God's blessing. Oh, but wait a minute. What about everybody that's gossiped about him? Oh, well... Oh, well, what? You think God's going to bless? Because my sin isn't His sin? Because my transgression isn't His transgression? 
Well, I just know the Lord's going to bless me because I don't have hair like that, neither do my sons. Yeah, but why did the Lord say He'd bless you if you didn't love your neighbor as yourself when He commanded you to love your neighbor as yourself? I never thought about that. I know you're busy thinking about what the other guy was doing wrong instead of what God wants us to do right. I'm telling you, we live in a day and time when we don't consult the Bible. We consult how we feel. And we latch on to the portions of the Bible that we feel good about. And those other 900 shekels we just keep in our pocket. I know, I know the Lord will do me good. Why? Well, because I'm doing the two things I want to do out of the Bible. What about the other nine things? Well, you know, those are just little minor things. Unless somebody else transgresses those things, and then they're major things. Yeah, verse 14. Oh, there's the 14. Look at that. Turn the page. It's another chapter. <laughs> I got an amplified version up here. <laughs> All right, 18.1. 18.1. In those days, there was no king in Israel. In those days, the tribe of the Danites sought them an inheritance to dwell in. For unto that day, all their inheritance had not fallen unto them among the tribes of Israel. The children of Dan sent of their family five men from their coast, men of valor from Zor and from Eshtel, to spy out the land and search it. And they said to them, Go search the land. Who, when they came to Mount Ephraim, to the house of Micah, they lodged there. When they were by the house of Micah, they knew the voice of the young man, the Levite, and they turned in thither and said unto him, Who brought thee hither? What makest thou in this place? What hast thou here? <laughs> hey, priest, how much you, how much the pay at this church? He said to them, Thus and thus dealeth Micah with me, and hath hired me, and I am his priest. Now, in a few minutes, Mike is going to be upset because he loses his priest. But Jesus told you in John chapter 10, a hireling is going to flee. You can't count on a hireling to stick around. He doesn't care for you.